and community college horticulture teacher and I've been on the uh, board, uh, the advisory board here for a while. Yoko principal. Uh, Molly Fantini, architect and project manager with SMMA. Matt Bryce, architect with SMMA. <clears throat> Mark Nevin, department head of the horticulture program. I'm Will Coffey, the chief procurement officer of the city of Northampton. Joshua Clark, assistant principal. So just as an update for the, the full committee, I, I want to thank Helen and Matt to sort of have weekly progress slash check-in meetings on Tuesday morning. So we met again this morning. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work, a lot of preliminary design work, uh, trying to get a lot of feedback. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to the full committee. If you want to give the full committee an update, I know there's some quality discussions, some info I'm looking for from a lot of you today to continue with the great direction. So, help. it's all you. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks. Good to see you all again uh, on this monthly basis. Um, we do have a lot of material to review with you today, um, so without further ado, I will try to advance the slides. <laughs> there. We're always sitting on the wrong side of the table. There, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, here's the, the rundown of what we're going to review with you all today, um, provide design updates uh, principally focused on the building, um, talk a little bit about site as well, um, so on the building plan itself, massing and materials discussions, we'd like to start our systems conversation focusing on mechanical, mechanical really leads the way um, in terms of uh, those decisions affecting the other disciplines uh, from an engineering standpoint, a schedule, quick schedule update, and then uh, next meetings. With so that, I am going to hand it over to Matt. So the, the plan refinements that we have to share here today are really more uh, gradual in terms of sort of the larger scale development that we looked at last time we met. Um, we have responded to some of the feedback, so I'll talk through some of that. Um, we've also had an opportunity to sit down with James and run through some of the more detailed uh, programming uh, information. I know he shared some of that information with Mark as well, and so some of that's still going to be coming back to us in terms of some, again, yeah, we're applying to resolution, but just to give you an idea of what's evolved here. Uh, we talked last time a little bit about the office space. Um, in the sense of trying to make the office space a little bit more amenable uh, to the instructors being within that space, being as their sort of critical um, role within the overall program. Um, and so what we've done to the office is actually expanded it a little bit, uh, got it right, right back up to the original 300 square feet that it was programmed at uh, before any of the production started to happen. Uh, we made sure that we still can accommodate the three staff members that are positioned in there, the space for uh, a small conference table to occur in there. Um, and we really focused on making sure there's as much sort of access to the shops as well as to the hallway um, as possible, both visual as well as physical through doorways. And the exact number of doorways is something that we're still sort of sorting through and it, it may get peeled back a little bit. I think what you see there is probably the, the, the maximum level of accessibility that we'll have. But that's one piece of development that we've had uh, completed. Uh, parts and pieces associated with that is that the climbing area that was immediately adjacent to it um, was previously located uh, closer to the lobby area. And so what we did is actually position, uh, there's a laser here. But, You've got Andy. I mean, <laughs> so it used to be here, <laughs> correct. And we moved it over. So two things that did for us. One, it made the climbing area much more visible, um, accessible to the office space. And so again, where students are gonna be um, sort of encountering the largest potential for sort of safety issues to occur. Makes sense to have that immediately adjacent to the office space. So that visibility was good. 
um, it, it sort of took the storage space, which was uh, impeding that uh, visibility, and sort of shifted it to the other side. So really, just a flipping of those burn spaces to get a little bit better functionality, uh, you know, within the horticulture shop, uh, which we thought was good. Uh, the other minor refinement is really the acknowledgement that the air compressor that's going to be serving the ag equipment repair shop um, has a significant amount of noise that's going to be generated from it. Um, and right now what we're showing is a dedicated room just to house the compressor. Um, DESI is certainly focused on decibel level for students being within that space and sort of the impact there. Um, so whether or not we have it in a separate storage room, whether or not we can just put it on the floor at the back of a larger storage room to sort of preserve uh, floor area and, and minimize uh, infrastructure costs. That's something that we'll have to sort out, but we want to at least acknowledge the fact that the compressor will need some accommodations in terms of how it's laid out. Other than that, uh, you pretty much have kept the layout as it stood uh, from last uh, time when we spoke. Um, the piece of feedback that Andy was alluding to that we're actually looking for uh, from this group uh, really ties to again, something we talked about the last time, which was we had pulled the building footprint down, but we really needed to have some input on the size of the equipment that's going to be going in the, the repair shop uh, in particular in terms of how it can fit in there. So we have three vehicle bays that are currently designed for that space. Um, and we have a, a certain depth there, um, which is about 24 feet in, in the base plan, which yields that overall 9,792 square foot footprint that you see in the right hand corner. Uh, what we did then is, on the right hand side of the slide, what you can see is we went through the equipment list uh, that the folks from Schoolhouse Construction had put together. Uh, and we looked at the lengths of all the drive-in equipment that could possibly be built into the shop. Um, so the vast majority of uh, those pieces can actually fit into that 24-foot bay with a, a good amount of clearance all the way around. And we have a diagram in a second that will show you. Uh, but ideally with three feet at the front and the back of the piece of equipment so that you could circle around even when the overhead bay door is closed uh, just to make sure that you know, it's in safe condition in terms of moving around the equipment. Um, so again, vast majority fits in there. There are a few pieces, two pieces exactly, if that would not. Um, they are 24 foot in depth or in length, so you could actually pull them in, but I mean, the front of that piece of equipment would be right at the wall. Um, it's probably not good for the longevity of the building or for the equipment in that scenario. So um, we just wanted to confirm whether or not that equipment has any value in terms of being pulled into uh, space um, or whether or not it's okay to think about that being stored elsewhere, being stored outside, but not having the ability to pull it. It's both for these pieces of equipment, and I guess you could also think long term in terms of future pieces if anything of a similar size would Get brought into the shop. Uh, the impact, we said that yes, we needed to pull in a 24 foot long piece of equipment, is that uh, the building would grow. Um, again, it's about six feet to the south. Um, overall net square footage impact of that is another 680 square feet, um, which on a percentage basis is actually it's something in terms of the overall piece, and it's will push the budget of the project up as well. But we didn't want to necessarily forego that conclusion and say this is directly where we wanted to go or that that was not valuable. We wanted to have the conversation here um, and make sure that that was uh, an appropriate direction to move in in terms of not allowing those, those two pieces. Yes. So I don't know, it might be a good point to just stop and have a little bit of conversation there rather than moving through everything. Um, what I can show also really quickly, advance this Right, so this is, this is just a diagram showing that clearance space around um, front loader, I think is what we have in here, uh, pulled in. And so on the left hand side is that 30 foot bay that shows the 24 foot length of the, um, the piece of equipment and the 3 foot clearance um, on the front to the back um, and the sides as well. We start to pull that down, you can see that the clearances get compressed. Um, and we honestly would not recommend the two scenarios on the right hand side. Um, it just becomes challenging in terms of interacting with the equipment. So, thoughts on, on length of equipment and what needs to be pulled into the, the shop? I, yeah, I'd like to chime in. I don't, the 10 years that I've been here, we haven't had the need to bring, store that equipment that size inside. Um, if it does have to be serviced, we have, I can refer to Tim, but we have alternative means to service that equipment on site in the automotive bay or agriculture mechanics. <clears throat> I think there's sufficient 
the spaces that already exist on campus that can be used for that. If it had to be stored, I think there's the garage at the up at the forest would be large enough to store it in. But I, I don't know. You know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've ever stored equipment in for any prolonged period of time in the existing bays that you have. We used to always store it all inside. We would have the, 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 the loader, the backhoe, and the truck all inside that front garage. The front garage? The front garage, yeah. Not since I've been here. There we are. Maybe not all three at once, but we have. We usually have the loader. For what, what purpose would you Storage, store it working on equipment, servicing it, maintaining it. We like right now. I have stuff in the back of the truck. I store it inside because I, otherwise I can't lock up the stuff the in the back of the, the truck. truck. The dump truck, yeah, and that's twenty-four feet. The existing one is twenty-four feet. Yes. So the the two bays that are still standing. Yes. You would pull the the dump truck. We'd have the dump truck, the backhoe in the middle, and then the loader. In the th in the two bay garage. Mm -hmm. So you weren't following these, these safety guidelines that they're proposing? There was still room around them to walk around them. It, now, we wouldn't be working on them with the three pieces in there. They'd be stored. Yep. But if we're working on them, you would be able to pull both in and work all around them, and as well as other things in between. How did you get, how did you get that in? You'd have, you'd have, what, two out, one in in the middle? Yes. To be able to, so you'd have one, and you'd, you'd maneuver it. So you put you were one in the middle, middle the, first, and then park two on either right. side. But when you were working on it, the other two would be out. One would be out. Usually one would be out, yeah. Because students can do the loader and the backhoe together for class. It's like some could be servicing one, some could be servicing the other at the same time as part of class. With like, you know. Same size equipment that we currently have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Have any thought been given to making this, because of the way that the topography is out there, of making this a two-story building and storing the equipment underneath and have the classrooms on the top? Original design had that as a possibility, um, but my recollection is the cost of it was. I know you're talking. You're talking a lot of money to move fill in there, and you know you've got a natural, like this slope in there. Drive the the equipment all could be in the bottom of the building, and the classroom up on top. The classroom, the way I understand, is going to be looking yeah. at it, looking at the soccer field. We talked about that. <laughs> the other placement. Yeah. <laughs> They estimated the cost to be high. And then there was questions around accessibility for all students and staff. I'd elevate yeah. something in there, I think would be would be fine. But you know, I know that, you know, I put in a lot of building and stuff and I built a garage myself. I mean it was it was very nice to put a concrete deck on it. I mean everything is fireproof down underneath now. And uh, all your equipment is down there, the smell, odor, anything like mm -hmm. that. Your air compressor could all be down there and have your classrooms all up on top on top. Well, we've also talked about a 60 by 80 um, potential down the line with Tim as a storage for areas. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been on the table too, separate from this building. Now, is there any any way that we could check the cost of doing doing it with a with a two story versus spreading it out? I mean, they don't make any more land here in the and it would take less of a footprint, correct? Yeah, I mean, it, it would take less of a footprint, right? Because yeah. we're stacking on top of each other. We would be adding two stairs um, because the number of occupants that you'd have to be able to do a single stair, you'd be adding an elevator. Yeah, an elevator, definitely. But I mean, all that equipment would be ground level and could all be driven in there. Right, but you lose the continuity between the ability to supervise the shops the, right next to the classrooms. This is the most efficient, visible layout to be on the floor. And I think yeah. cut and fill wise, we are really uh, looking to minimize the imbalance on the site. Yeah, it, we're still waiting for the final survey to come back to us to validate all the cut fill numbers, but where we position this, um, especially I think at that A1 elevation, which was going down lower, um, we're moving away from trying to bring in a lot of fill. It was really trending towards a balanced site. Yeah, you, you know, it's like here in New England, we all have a basement in our homes, which makes a lot more storage, and it's a lot cheaper doing it that way than to sprawl it out and like they do in the western part of the states and and uh to, to make it twice as big 
you know, it would be a, sm a smaller footprint like that, and you know, you're already using the land that's already there. So I just didn't know if they could weigh in on that situation. I mean, I walked over there the last meeting that we had, and I took a look at it. And it looked to me like, you know, something like that might work. But I, I, I hear your thoughts, um, but to me, not understanding your methodology, the concerns for visibility and, and supervision are real. But in my simplistic head, your roof is smaller and your your foundation is smaller because you're sharing it. And so it, it's hard for me to see how it's more expensive to have a smaller roof and half a foundation. It's providing floor structure for that amount as well, which is something above and beyond that would be why. Okay. And that, that's where my shortcomings come in. Yeah. Fair. And I'm not sure how challenging it would be for us to run it through the cost estimator. They may need an entire set of plans to just lay the thing out with all those components in it to be able to give us a good number. Okay. No, I just don't think it's been in our experience that uh, multiple story building is less costly than a single story building where we can do it. I, in my head, it was simply topography that, like, uh, if, you, if you have a sort of levels. Yeah. yeah. They're like, gosh, and that lend itself to sort of a yeah. uh, under under parking as it were. So it's, we're not creating a parking garage, we're creating a teaching space and to have it all on level with the best visibility for supervision and safety, I think it's, maybe that's, that's as far as it needs to go. But So Mark, back, back to the conversation. The garages in that drawing, how do they, well, how, I guess the question for Helen first is, how do they compare to the existing double bay garage? And it's, you're saying that you were already doing similar maintenance in a garage, the same is it, is it the same size? No, it's no. 40, I think 40 it's forty feet deep. Right. So the, the existing. They oh, oh. Okay, you're talking about that. Okay. The yes. two bay garage we have right now is forty say, feet deep. I thought deep you were saying twenty four also. No, 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 no. It's okay. forty feet deep. Yeah. What's interesting is that the garage that burned down that was actually more analogous to what we had here in terms of the depth. There was one short bay because of the stairs in there, and there was one deeper bay, but they both had the ten foot doors. <laughs> Door width is also something. Or talk about it a little bit here. Um, but how deep was the one that burned? It was 24 at the deeper at section. The, deepest the shorter side. one was like 20 because of the stair that was in there, so it was tougher. So it'd be curious to hear a little bit about sort of how that, that was, was really a one bay garage because there was a tool room built where you're talking there was another okay. bay yep. and where the stairs were. So really it was just a one bay garage that we pulled in. And then there was benches and the air compressor at this end of it. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't have been able to fit most of the heavy equipment in there. We fit our bulldozer in, but that was it. Tim, how much of the maintenance would be done by our maintenance tech versus on the heavy machinery now versus? Yeah, that would be up to what they're comfortable with. Okay. Or what, how, how severe the breakdown was, I guess. Can I ask a question? Right. So, so that's a long list of equipment. <laughs> Obviously, all of it can't be in the building at once. It, and so there's there's obviously some kind of rotation here about what is stored inside for a certain amount of time. Would it be possible to make one bay deeper so that, you know, when you needed to work on that, the, the two pieces of large equipment, you could cycle them in? I, I know square footage is tight, but rather than expanding the whole building for a single bay, I think it's a great thought. I mean, it's something that we were discussing was we're not sure the simulator classroom needs to be as big as it you have it because that's like our my existing classroom and that's way bigger than they need for the four simulators. What if we were to put the office on that side, kind of like on the hallway end of that simulator room? Because then you would have room for at least one bay be deeper. Mm -hmm. Or even if you flip the storage to over where the office is and have the outside one be the deeper bay, however it was arranged, yeah. you could at least get one, if not two bays. On the far right hand side, you mean? Yeah. Of that drawing? Yep. <clears throat> could the air compressor be put on an outside, just a small, almost storage? room, you know, almost like a, a, a an electrical room or something off of it that would allow for that bay to be bigger and, and maybe move that storage and door. Maybe the storage moves closer to the office or adjacent to it. 
it, that just a small little annex almost is built for the generator, it takes care of decibels mm -hmm. or any other concerns, but then would allow two bays to be deeper in the existing footprint, right? Sort of off the plan off of what you're suggesting. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the other things that we found through some site investigations, there would likely need to be a small pump uh, for the sewer coming out of that as well, and that's similar to what's for the animal science building right now that has one of those. Um, it's probably an appendage that already needs to be added on. Um, so if we looked at that Sorry. as housing both the compressor and the... That moved here, the door moved here, and then this was... Right. You would be able to have two full... What would that, what would the distance be with that? Uh, it's probably another eight to ten feet yeah. uh, in terms of depth that you could get on there. Would, Mark, would that be enough? If you um, were at... 34 or 36 feet? Well, I mean, 36 might, we were, he was just, we were just talking the tractor on the trail that you can't, wouldn't be able to park in any of those bays. You would have to. You'd have to disengage. Right, and then park, find room for the tractor as well. But that, yes, another 30, making it 36 feet deep would make it viable. Oh, yeah. Okay. For example, the dump truck is 25 feet long. So right now it doesn't fit in any of those. You know, even with the best driver shoehorn in it, you know, mm -hmm. and so that would be helpful. Is there any concern to, I like your idea of putting a bump out, it makes the building more intricate and interesting, but now it presents a little uh, hidey space. If there's a concern about safety, about making a dark corner where a kid could be doing something we wish they weren't. No, I'm thinking that that would be more like an external building, uh, but no, I don't think that would increase. You have the animal science building on that side. We had, okay. If if I recall the design we had, you have a path coming down. So I think there it would have visibility because there would be there would be movement. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And and if it being outside concern, I mean we're going to have external things uh, so you can make sure that we can see that. Yep. That's gone. Or a or window from the inside. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other question tied to this then is the width of the bay doors, and again, it sort of ties to what's out there right now, which has a 12 foot six wide uh, garage bay door to it, um, versus the garage um, or half a garage that's burned down at 10 foot wide doors. So what we're showing here right now is 10 feet, uh, but that's only because we're showing a 12 foot grid spacing um, as it stands. Something that can still be adjusted as we're trying to finalize details, but we wanted to also have everyone be comfortable with the width of the doors going in there from. Understanding that we have student drivers that are uh, bringing things in there. We'll have bollards on the outside, we'll have bollards on the inside to protect the building from vehicle strikes. But um, sort of where everyone's level of comfort is with the width of a door going in to the garage. Most of your highway departments around have either 14 or 16 foot doors. Mm -hmm. Those guys are rookies. They shouldn't be driving those trucks. Mm -hmm. Those are bigger trucks, so often. You're, some of the vehicles are going to be small tractors and things like that. Do you see 10 feet or 12? 10, so 10 feet is what we're showing here. 10 feet is on what was on the section that burned down. 12 foot six is what you have on the garage out there right now. A similar approach could be used, right, where the last one or two bays could Make be slightly wider. wider. Especially if that's the deeper bay as well, that would make yeah. some sense. Right? Yeah. There, there's been many a times that the center wall on that building and the garage doors, well, more the storage bays, uh, have been hit and broken and damaged and repaired by students uh, yeah. hitting it. Even with the 12 foot six wide doors. Yeah. Oh yeah, they've t they've knocked that center <laughs> that center part off and the left side off. Um, many a times we've had to fix the open the garage door rails and. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. lots do we of want three bays or do you want a 12 and a 14? Like if you think down the line, what the needs of the program could have. Ten years from now, would it, people want more entrances in and out of that garage space or larger? We're going the twenty foot door. Is it condition space? If that's the case. Smaller doors, more smaller. So we'll have that yeah, conversation. Part of the HVAC discussion yeah. in a couple yeah. minutes. Yeah. yeah. Something to think about. Yeah. It's an entirely different zone. Yeah. Yes. My experience, you know, the bigger the door, the better. <laughs> <laughs> the, second, 
Yeah. And also, it also it's, it's not yeah, it's not just about you know necessarily equipment. Yeah. Sometimes you're making a project like a float for the, mm -hmm. for, it, for the Holyoke Parade, mm -hmm. and you know it's hanging off the trailer, and you know. So it's just um, being able to think about like like flexibility of the space. Also, you know, they, there's like different tiers of usage, mm -hmm. I guess, on that. I agree. Yeah. Sure, anything, anything, anything small and big. Right. What? How big are the doors on on the automotive and collision? What's that door? Is that a twenty foot? No. Um, I think they're what are they? Twelve or fifteen feet. This reduces 12, and this is 12. No. So it would take. And well, next the same? Well, yeah, I think that's uh, a little bit here. here. Oh, they can see a lot of body on the foot. Yeah. Okay. So you would gain 2, 4. You gain 6 feet. You mm -hmm. went 12 feet. On the wall. Because you don't want to lose wall space here. Especially if they put a door. Is there a drawback to larger doors being like extremely large doors, like a 20? Are those less longevity because of the physical pressures on them and stuff like that? It's pretty. I've been in my house for. That's usually one less three feet. What if um, if we went to two 12 foot doors? But left on the right hand side where the backhoe is, like a three foot depth to the wall, and we put some cabinets along there. Yeah, kind of like we, the, which we space. had, we had that in the back garage. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be dead space, but we would have storage there as well. But we, uh, 10 foot doors, I don't think is going to work with students driving stuff. The driving stuff. They, they have to get it perfectly lined up to get some of the stuff right in. That's great. That's so the what, feedback we're looking for. What makes the most sense? A single door or a 12 and a 14 or 20? Sure. Why don't you tell us what you think you want and we'll test it out for you and come back. I think we'd prefer two. Two 12 footers minimum? Minimum two 12, maybe a 12 and a 14. Okay. I mean, the three's, three is nice, but I don't think it's going to work with the, the size we have and what we would need for students' Are you skills. A span issue with that? Not typically, but you can sort of some sort of span hole uh, that goes over the top of it just okay. to carry it's not it up. Wall. I don't think so. Right. Um, if, if we sort of knock that one down, I'm noting that the greenhouse seems to be pivoting like a winter wiper. <laughs> Um, just, just for what it's worth, to me, the greenhouse sort of being in line with the rest of the building is less aesthetically interesting, but it does mean that the broad side of the greenhouse is facing south. And so for, for solar gains, that's the most productive way to have it, but it is not the most interesting way to have it. I think interest from sort of a visual standpoint is one criteria. I think also sort of the viability of it working in the site plan is going to be another driving criteria. Yep. Again, we're, we're apologize for keep going back and saying we're waiting on the final survey to be able to do that, but yep. that's just the reality okay. of the situation. Um, our sense is that it's probably going to fall in this so configuration in some way, shape, or form, just because, especially with the A and the A1 um, mm -hmm. options that we looked at last time in terms of site plan, it, it works better with the grading and sort of just framing the service yard around the back as well. And but also, I think Mark. I think at one point, maybe a couple of minutes ago, we were talking about the greenhouse. That's predominantly going to remain hydroponics, aquaponics, all that. Yes. And we, we have supplemental lighting for that. So if it's not perfectly oriented, then, you know, the supplemental LED lighting for growing is going to be provide the extra we need. Thank you. I think if parking is to the left, it's going to be the nicest presentation, too. Any other questions on, on the plan? Again, we haven't changed a lot here, but uh, before we move on to uh, some of the other areas. The, the square footages are like vacillating just a little bit. 
like a hundred up and down? Is there are you changing the width height ratios or am I just is it just wall widths and where the walls are and where doors are that's changing? Yeah, I, I can't tell you between when we were here last time. So I've got four B two um, on, on the printout here is uh, nine seven six four and then here we have nine seven nine two. So it's not a big difference, but it's just a wee difference. I wondered whether there were sort of overall footprint changes. Not intentionally. Um, um, we just it's it, we'll just have to go back and figure out where that is. Overall the dimensions are more or less the same just yeah. right now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have a, I had I made a whole list of stuff looking at the plan um, last week, but some of that I think we could just go over it's more tweaking what we want, not the overall project. Sure. Um, in the on the, the mechanical end there, you have three rooms. Correct. Water room, electric, what's the MDF? It's a main distribution frame. It's essentially the IT room where the data okay. comes in. And then Where's there's... HVAC? So we're, be... we're going to talk about HVAC as well. It's actually, we'll likely not have a dedicated room for it. Um, we will need to look at a water heater um, in some location, um, but the potential that goes in the water. Because the other thought, would, could the compressor go down at that end into those rooms? If there's space, certainly. Um, we'll have to look at the length of the lines from the compressor to uh, the shop as well. Sometimes if it gets too long, we have to put it in the air dryer in to make sure that we don't get condensation in the line as it comes that distance. But um, it's something that we can look at as a possibility. Sure. The compressor needs to be in a conditioned space, surely. Otherwise, you're going to get frozen it's condensation out there. Right, yeah, it has to be insulated. Yeah. Right. What's your air compressor used for? Cleaning the equipment and yeah, driving air tools. It's not a. Most of, the, most of the tools right now that my mechanics use everything are all battery operated. I mean, well, yeah, but the clean like power saws. Clean. Yeah, an air compressor for that. Yeah, fill the tires. We don't really need a huge air, air compressor. We, we don't have to. Not, right not like with the electric tools that they have out there today that you can just walk around. You don't need a hose and all that other crap. It's still noisy, though, like a small one, a big one. That's the concern. It's the noise, no, it's not the what, what size did you have, get us to? Back in here. You can't remember. It's not that. It's not that. It's barely though. Yeah. 25 horse, 30 horse. I couldn't. It stands like five, six feet, five feet tall. It's big around. But I think for the rest of the items, yeah, we're happy to sit with you. Um, just talk through just as we could do that. Yeah. All right. Move along from the plan then. These are all on slab, right? That's what we're saying. These are all on slab. Slab there. Uh, so I think we're going to talk now a little bit about the massing of the building. Um, so again, this is a follow on conversation to uh, the last building committee meeting we had. Uh, we talked a lot about the, the site plan, some really good conversation about sort of pros and cons of different locations, um, different configurations of the building. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion about sort of the elevation of the building as well, what the perception would be um, approaching the building and sort of what the sense of it would be, trying to alleviate any notion of the building being recessed. Um, so what we did is um, created a, a pair of animations, actually. So this is it's a very simple model. Again, it's not completely informed by the topography information that we have, so it's, it's taking some liberties in terms of that. We're showing a higher elevation here in the field, you'll see a lower elevation, but beyond that, it, it sort of um, just brings itself out. But this gives you an idea of, um, if I just go back to that site plan, A option. Uh, things to remember about this option in terms of the building footprint is that we're a little bit closer uh, up to the corner. I think it's building B, if I'm not mistaken. There, uh, across the focal point in terms of what we're showing, uh, a little bit closer to the field. And then the second option that we ran a model and animation of is option A1 that you'll see afterwards shifts the building um, a little bit further to sort of the bottom, uh, the right-hand corner, um, and it also lowers the building elevation. So this is the one that was up at 229 in terms of the elevation, and the second was at 225. Um, so I'm going to try and just hit play on this and hope this works. There we go. So you get a sense of from across the field, uh, moving down the entry drive, sort of what the perception of the building is. So this is, I wouldn't say this is at all 
um, a condition where I was in a building in Sunken um, uh, down. Uh, I think it's, it really still does have a presence across the field. It feels good from an overall massing standpoint. Um, obviously, certainly welcome other thoughts. And we're happy to run through it again too after, maybe after we look at the second one. Uh, but then this option A1 again shifts the building footprint again to the south and to the east of it um, and lowers it down to 225. Um, so it's the same path, so you get a sense of what that is going to look like going through. Um, I think the nice thing here is it's really the third sort of the high glass of um, the shop spaces along um, is still very prominent, visible, especially when you get to this point. There's enough distance between the field and the, and the green drop is gradual enough where it doesn't feel like we're burrowing down into the ground, uh, more or less. Uh, just again, from our, our analysis perception view of it. Uh, but again, happy to run through this one again, or the previous one, if you just want to try to. It looked vaguely like there were two garage doors on the west side. That's not the case, case, right? It's not the case. Yeah, those were um, intended to be, I if I can go back to it. A roll of classroom wall? Or more when we were thinking about the retail space as being a dedicated space or there, that there might have been some retail opportunity to come up to it. But we haven't fully updated this model with uh, what we have yeah. there. That's perfect. <laughs> Sorry, I can't freeze it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> it's this thing, because you waving my hand around. <laughs> uh, so, again, I'm happy to, you want me to go back and go to the first one again just to. The difference is four feet, right? Yes. So one of the things that I'm seeing about your entrance, the main entrance of the building, is that at 225, where we are now, you have to go down a walk. So you have a sense of the building being lower. Whereas at 229, the main entrance of the building is at, is even with the grade of the sidewalk at that Point. Am, I, am I reading that correctly? It is. Um, and again, I just want to caveat it a little bit by the fact that the green here is simplified, so there may be some new ones that are not necessarily Fair. 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 But in one case, you're, you're as you walk to this building across campus, you walk on the sidewalk, and at 229, you turn left, and you walk in the front door. At 225, you then have to take a path that takes you down four feet to the front door. I prefer it being high at 229. And it also just means less infrastructure as far as walkway, et cetera, et cetera. Or water management, the uh, uh, rings around, uh, it's it's All that stuff. But can't that be graded? That side of the building can't be graded. The corner couldn't be graded. So that you're, I mean, you're, either way you go down that campus, you're actually coming down. Yes. So, I mean, the address itself can be, we can create whatever we have to. Couldn't we? If you did the two story, it'd be pretty easy to walk in. Depending on where you're, well, we'd have to walk no. up then. Like, uh, but if you go, if, if we walk down there right now, in the, in this in this one, you're not just shifting it back; you're shifting it over. Correct. Um, it, the virtue in this one is simply it's four feet less fill. That's the that's the advantage. It's closer to closer to the balance site. It also, if you remember, just in terms of connection to the animal science building that's down there and sort of the, the mm -hmm. vehicular access mm -hmm. to the service yard okay. um, becomes a lot simpler and more connected here. There's less sort of driving around to get in it because everything is down at that lower um, okay. elevation, almost ambient to what's down there right now. Um, it just facilitates access into, um, into the garage doors mm -hmm. primarily. Also, when you think about fire um, apartment vehicle access, right? They'll, if they're able to get down, it's that same sort of use of access that we see as a benefit with this with this up. Can we see plan? Yep. I said that. There it is. All right. So this is the arc that's connected down. Mm -hmm. So you can I like the idea of parking lots being more uh, together so that it allows a greater functional space for practicing maneuvers or what have you. But I am concerned about the entrance. If there is a, a step down that, that would be well cared for, it's for accessibility, for stormwater management, 
snow plowing, things like that. I do think we'll have the ability to get into a more nuanced understanding and design of that as we get the grading information. Yes. We'll, we'll be able to represent something to you that hopefully moves towards that. I, I think that's the right direction to go in, that you certainly want the front door to feel like it is welcoming and expected to the rest of the campus versus something that is down below. I, I think a commonality, though, across the two designs is that it looks terrific across the field. I really like the look of it. I think it's it has modernity. It has sort of a, an interest. Um, it looks like the best bleacher sheets, you know, at, at the like Kentucky Derby, quite frankly. I think it's really excellent. So overall, the design's great. I think we really like the finish at little tiny bits. Yeah, but, but important bits as well. So yeah, fair, yeah. but on, on balance, I think it's no, I just, really funny. I mean, when I was looking at it, but, Thought in my mind was how do I actually <laughs> get creatures to the length of the, of the um, press box that almost symmetrically mimic the building? So that as you're looking at it, that's one of the things that went through my mind. I think it's a great point. It does look really nice. And the Claire story goes a long way towards not making that building feel low or hidden or tucked down. As well as the roof plane of the, uh, the climbing tower right. structure, I think letting that rise up. I just had another thought about the greenhouse, which orientation. If it is with the, the main line, then it is more vulnerable to like, uh, fugitive lacrosse balls. That's the point. Well, it depends. What's it, what's it made of? Glass. Glass. It's, glass. Glass. it's glass. 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 Is it plastic? Like virgin yeah. plastic. Yeah, like yeah. The, yeah. the, the hard plastic. Yeah. But that's an attractive nuisance slash target. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm pulling the building away down to 225. Right. It helps limit impact to the field. You got to go farther. Though. <laughs> they, they, really, they really like the scoreboard and the and yeah. the collision repair teacher's car outside. <laughs> by having, by, by having the, the greenhouse sort of pivoted yes, down. Yes, it, it yeah. takes that away. It gets it away. Right. Yeah. Have a safe. Hopefully the same is true about the Claire story. That's what I mean for my job. Attraction nuisance. It's flattering and realistic. So another topic that ties into the sort of exterior design appearance of the building. We'll talk a little bit about the exterior cladding materials. Um, both in terms of this building, but also how it relates to the rest of the campus. Uh, and so this is, even as we were thinking about sort of the, the renderings that we created for the interview, we sort of made note of the fact that most of the buildings on campus, there's this sort of uh, historical vernacular of the red barn um, that is located around many buildings on campus, right? Aside from the brick buildings. Um, but it, it's something that is here, and we think that we need to respect and really um, acknowledge and tie into it in terms of the, the new building as well. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of precedent for how that can come together. Um, different options that we can consider for cladding the building uh, that can achieve that aesthetic. Um, certainly metal panels, uh, vertically oriented in this case, um, is something that is familiar. Uh, we know that many other buildings that are being built right now are using that red metal siding. Um, so there would be some commonality in terms of the finish uh, that would be going up, and that's probably a good thing. Um, of the materials that we're looking at, uh, this is probably on the higher price point as well, but in certain cases it's worth paying for that durability, right? If you buy something that's a little less uh, durable, you're going to end up replacing it or painting it maybe on a more frequent basis. Um, but different options in terms of um, how refined we can get that metal paint as well that does impact the price point of where it comes. So we just got to that place that we undoubtedly are going to talk about carbon and the consequences. That making wood siding, while it has painting and management and maintenance, is made of carbon versus the metal siding, which has a carbon cost. Right. And right. so to me, we got to make that decision. Yeah, I think once we get into looking at the actual cost estimate, we'll, we'll look at what the dollar, first dollar cost of those are. We can also look at what the carbon footprint uh, body carbon is of those different materials. Um, and we can weigh those two things together and sort of see where the, where the math lays out. I, I think the forest products industry is prepared to support the, the building if it is going to take pains to use Massachusetts forest products. Mm -hmm. And so especially uh, Roxanne, which is siding, 
to order that and is a thing that the Massachusetts Forest Products Industry would like to support. It would be a, a real lost opportunity to not uh, herald the, the good work that happens in this industry. Yeah, really, I think that, that ties into the thinking that we've been doing on certainly the structure of the building and extension and installation as well. Every opportunity, I think, that both exists for us to tie into the goal and mission of the program, but also to potentially receive donated materials. Um, those are tremendous benefit in both. It'd be nice if a guy had a sawmill in the room. With the possibility, if you look at all those factors, do we have almost a showcase wall versus the entire thing um, that's able to show that and be part of that? If we're looking at cost, resiliency, the upkeep and maintenance that for years to come, I think there's a lot that has to be balanced, not, you know, along with the, 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 the equation of of the initial carbon and, and you know what it takes to get that in there and all that. I think there's a lot that we have to think of around, long, around the terms of longevity and upkeep and maintenance and, and pressure that's put on school and cost down the line. So I'd like that to be part of the discussion and balance point. I absolutely hear you. The inconvenient truth about climate change is that we have to accept those difficulties. The, the That's not the, what I'm saying. I'm but, talking about it sounded to me like you're saying that you believe the forestry products are ready to donate all of the wood to collaborate the building. That's what I thought I heard you say. And what I'm hearing is, from an administrator standpoint, sitting at a school, that is tons of upkeep. If you look at some of those photos, you can see the amount of upkeep and uh, time management that has to go into it. I think that that has to be part of the equation. Is the pressure that it puts on the system 10 years from now also has to be reflected in decision making. Is that what you were saying? Or um, so, you're... so to clarify what I'm saying is that the Massachusetts Forest Products Industry is, is prepared to support whether it's donate or make the price competitive with whatever siding. And so having a focal wall made of wood is not going to get it done. Um, okay. Yes, a wood-sided building is going to require more maintenance, but we have 100, 200-year-old wood-sided buildings that may not be at school, so it's a mm -hmm. fair, fair point. But the inconvenient <clears throat> truth is that we can't, as a society, afford to make siding out of metal. That's just the deal. And so, while it seems like a, a easier product, it's more durable, it's cheaper in the long term, we just can't afford to use the cheaper siding, like the plant can. That's just the inconvenient truth. So, other options that are here, um, but similar to what Scott was describing in terms of natural wood, there's also a fiber cement versions of all of the... Which is worse. <laughs> Which is worse. <laughs> yeah. awesome. Certainly from a carbon standpoint, worse. Uh, from a cost standpoint, better um, in terms of first cost. Um, just so, and our intent is to try to give you a range in terms of when we pull the budget together. And these are all completely valid um, aspects to think about when we're selecting exterior materials. Um, and, it's and this may not be the hill we die on. That's the other truth. I mean, like, this is a big building and there's other decisions not the least of which is the size of the building. Yeah. And it has to get there's paid a lot for of somehow. And yeah, so, there's a lot of factors and we have to balance it. Absolutely. Yeah, so so about, I don't want to make this the deal breaker. What about cross laminated beams as well? I mean, the university just built a huge building. Over there. That, that's inside stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's inside rather than the, in the steel. And, you know, the, the temperature that that would take versus steel, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, the, yeah. if that was. Would probably be in this other building instead of steel beams, it, it wouldn't have all collapsed. But the steel just, when it hits the temperature, it's just rolls around. My sawmill works on the ground, so I know the wood was still standing, and the, and the metal was all twisted and on the ground. You, you began by talking about that in our first meeting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. No. Hold, yeah. hold on, hold on. There's more. <laughs> it might be the next one. It is the next one. So this is yeah, just the. So let everyone know that we are still trying to pursue um, cross laminated timber in terms of decking, um, potentially wall, exterior wall structure as well, um, Ulam beams uh, for the primary structure as well as heavy timber columns or maybe Ulam columns. It all depends on sort of how that all plays out. Uh, the good thing is that given the size of our building, uh, that we're not looking at a fire rated structure. Um, there will be a fire protection system within the building. Um, but just as, as you just described, the wood will provide inherent uh, fire resistant qualities due to the charred nature of it and the dimensional yeah. nature of it. 
Um, so this is something we're having active conversations with. Um, I think John pointed us in the direction of maybe some free uh, CLT panel that might be out there for available to the project. It's, it's more than that. So um, for those of you who may be familiar with this, the, the governor implemented a moratorium on harvesting on state lands. And it was a sort of, it's being construed as a pause. And the governor recognizing that was a real burr under the saddle for a lot of uh, practitioners. And so the governor has recently made a million dollars available and is asking how does the industry want to use that? And to me, I feel like split in half, make one sort of a, a promotional <coughs> in, in great curriculum, inform people what forestry actually is, and the other is a direct educational opportunity. Yeah. And so I think there's an opportunity for quite a bit of support for this sort of thing. So stand by on that, but I think that, that it's not just a sort of a token DCR leftovers, it's the governor wants to help a lot. Yeah, I think that's great. I think the, we did have a conversation with the folks that sort of had potentially had those panels available and they had gotten allocated to another project. But I think we appreciate it. I mean, any outreach that any member of the community can do in terms of helping to pursue any of those opportunities, because we'll, we'll chase them down if we get pointed in the right direction in terms of where they are. Yep. And and those are still internal part. discussions between DCR um, and the other sister divisions of EEA, but mm -hmm. the governor said, would a million make it better? And <laughs> yes, it would, but is it by another sawmill or help with machines on, <coughs> on a sawmill and the industry is saying, yeah, that's great, you know, but it's that's the give a fish versus teach a fish, and this yeah. is the teach a fish. Yeah. I mean, from an aesthetic standpoint, I think this would be just a wonderful environment. I think it's the modern day equivalent of the knotty pine, right? <laughs> that you love so much. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. The knotty pine <laughs> is better than that old paneling we have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this was just a precedent project that we had pulled up. This is actually New York, but uh, somewhat analogous in terms of the type of space as well, high bay type of space. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so we'll start with HVAC systems. I mean, as Helen said, this is really because um, they're going to drive some of the other systems. We'll come back with our engineers and talk specifically about nuances of electrical and plumbing. Um, this set of slides that I should put together by our mechanical engineer. I ran through them with her just to make sure I could talk to it um, efficiently. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer every detailed question if there's any um, ringers in the crowd in terms of really being able to dive into the mechanical systems, but I, I can give you a good overview of what we have as options. Um, and then we're happy to take those questions back if there are some, uh, pose them to our uh, HVAC engineer and then we'll address the discussion when we meet again. This is just sort of the primary introduction. Um, so to start off with, I just want to caveat that all these mechanical systems that we're going to talk about today are all electric systems. Um, there's challenges in terms of natural gas um, out there in terms of energy code. There's also certainly uh, challenges in terms of getting gas on campus. Tim let us know that for the companion animal building, he looked into trying to get gas to that building and the company would not even bring it here. Um, so it's really pointing us in a different direction um, from number of different factors. I think it's a good direction to move in, but um, all electric is sort of what we're looking at for all of the options that we're going to look at here today. You're missing a fuel. We have the biomass is out there as yep. a... As a it, it should be option three. It's not presented, it should be. Okay, well it, we, we can talk that through. I think the challenge with the biomass is the cooling aspect of it as well, and sort mm -hmm. of how we achieve that. Yep. Um, and so maybe that's where my we could talk for hours about <laughs> how air source heat pumps <laughs> failed in the middle of winter. So and you're, if you're going to hit a greenhouse and air source heat pump, you're going to be buying new banana plants. It's not going to work. Yeah. So let me get through this first, and then we can, we can circle back on some of the other alternatives that are there. Um, Really, this breaks down into sort of two categories. One is fully, in, in, well, again, take a step back, that we're going to have systems we're going to talk about for the classrooms and the regular occupied spaces. And then we're going to have systems that we're going to talk about for the shops because the shops are, um, during the winter, they just need heating. Um, during the summer, those doors are going to be open the majority of the time. So trying to pay for air conditioning, those shops may not be the best investment in terms of overall systems. And that's obviously something we want everyone's concurrence on. but. That's sort of our general feeling of it. So when we're talking about these first systems, uh, which do involve air conditioning, uh, they're generally for the classroom spaces primarily. 
Um, two that are on the left represent sort of true um, air conditioning in, in sort of mechanical sense of the term. Can you say any sure. classroom spaces or you're also talking about uh, head house and space? I think we can we can have that conversation. Our sense is that the head house, yes, is more like a classroom space than it is a shop space given the amount of time that it's open to the surrounding environment, but that's We'd love that input if you feel otherwise and you think it's That's more right. of a shop. Okay, right. right. thank you. Yep. <clears throat> um, so it, it, this is just gonna give the overview. We have some, some diagrams on the following slides that help just get a mental image of what all these systems represent. Um, but option one on the um, full air conditioning and heating side, um, there's a VRF system, so it's variable refrigerant flow. Um, these are the condensing units that sit um, Sort of outside, either on the ground or on the roof. Um, they're tied to refrigerant that runs throughout the building. Um, similar to the mini splits that people are familiar with, um, this is sort of a more um, purpose built. Usually, mini splits are sort of something you do after the fact and retrofit. Um, a VRS system is sort of the same technology, but it's, it's purpose built um, from day one. Um, so, that provides the cooling to cassette units that are usually in the ceiling, um, as well as heating that comes from up above. Um, that's paired with um, a ventilation system, which are these energy recovery ventilators or ERPs. Um, these are small little units that are going to hang above the ceiling. Um, they take air in, um, they exhaust air out, um, and then they have an energy recovery wheel that's tied into them. And so it, in terms of efficiency, um, from an energy use and operations cost standpoint, that option one is, is most typically what we see in terms of high efficiency um, systems. The cost is a little bit higher on that system than maybe some others, but um, it is something that's worth considering. Uh, option two is a little bit different in that it incorporates an air handling unit. Um, and then the heat pump function, uh, similar to what's being driven out um, to all the cassettes with option one, is actually integrated in with that air handling unit. So all your heating and cooling is actually distributed out to the spaces through ducts. And so you're moving heat and cooling with air as opposed to with refrigerant. That's sort of the primary difference between the two. Um, and then the one on the right, the green cooling and the 100% heating, um, this is something that we've done on some past projects, which is not provide a full level of cooling in, again, the HVAC sense of the term. Um, what we do here is actually provide cooling to the supply air and dehumidification to the supply air as it's drifting down to uh, the classrooms. Um, but we don't actually recondition the recirculation air and the fan box, the fan power boxes that are located out near the classrooms, they're taking that air, they're mixing it with fresh air that's coming in um, at an acceptable code rate in terms of what's provided there. But it means that your temperature, instead of getting down to the 68 or the 70 degrees that you might with traditional air conditioning, you might be up closer to 74 or 75 degrees um, on, on the hotter days of, of the year, um, which are not, they're not, the majority of days, but also we know with climate change that those days seem to be increasing on us. Um, so it's it's a way of reducing both first cost as well as operating costs by sort of mitigating the amount of air conditioning that you can do, if that makes sense. The one thing I'll say about that green cooling approach is that we typically pair it with um, more traditional technologies, just like ceiling fans, to help de-stratify the air and sort of bring the cooling um, and the heating down to people. Um, we feel it's, it's a really effective way and that all these options are all going to incorporate operable windows into the, the classroom spaces and head house spaces just because we know that if you're in a space the most frustrating thing is not being able to control anything and the system is doing its thing and all you want to do is open the window and get some relief and it, there's real value to that in terms of user satisfaction in spaces. So that's that's the sort of overview of what we're going to talk about for the classrooms for the shops um, there's really two options. One is sort of the full HVAC condition, um, again, with the heat pumps. Um, we would suggest that the ERVs, again, be used, but then exhaust fans as well. We know that we have to make sure the exhaust is handled from those spaces. Or we think about the shops as um, just heating and ventilation only. Um, again, most of the ventilation during the summer is going to be done with those doors being up. Um, and so we, in that case, have electric unit heaters uh, that are surrounding the space. Um, and probably more typical to what you'll find in the other shops on campus as well. So when you think about equity standpoint from the rest of the campus, maybe may, may make sense of leaning in that direction, but again, we wanted to propose the different options here. 
Um, just not, not we're talking about really at all, but just understanding that the support rooms that are around the building, the electrical rooms, the water rooms, they're going to need uh, medium ventilation. We talked about the compressor space as well, um, if that comes to pass. Um, and then just to give you a, a visual diagram as well of how these different systems function. Uh, so we go back to that option one, which is the VRF variable refrigerant flow. This is an air source heat pump, as John mentioned. Um, there are uh, the condensing units that's either on a roof um, or on grade. Um, when we looked at those animations and walked around the building, um, it was part of it was nice because there was nothing sort of cluttering that roof in front of the clerestory story as well. Um, so you might want to be thinking of systems like this where we could think about the condensing unit going on the ground versus the roof. It also um, takes away the, the need for really anyone to get up on the roof in terms of maintenance aside from the occasional roof drain cleaning. Um, so that could be seen as a benefit as well, maybe the same reason why we sort of trended away from the green roof. Um, the refrigerant is then passed through to these cassette units that are in the classroom ceilings throughout, um, and that's paired with the ducts that are feeding into the, uh, the ERV units. We'll have louvers on the wall um, for this particular mechanical system to pull in natural air, uh, fresh air, and then exhaust air out, sort of separated enough from each other. And those, so that those ducts pass in loops, as you can imagine, into that box with the energy recovery wheel and sort of that diamond shape in the middle. That's how that works. Uh, the air handling unit, this is the more probably the most traditional um, when people think of HVAC systems, that there's a big package unit that's up on the roof. Um, here the condensing unit um, is shown in that image as sort of being part of that air handling unit package. Um, so it just is discharging heat and uh, or rejecting heat, accepting heat from directly atmosphere. Um, the other way of thinking about this system is that you can take the air handling unit and put it in the building can either hang it above a ceiling. Um, you could put it on the floor of the building, but it takes up space, so we don't necessarily want to go that route. Um, we do want to make sure it's not positioned over um, any type of learning environment because these can get noisy. Um, and even if there's a ceiling, that noise can translate through and it can be very uh, distracting for educational environments. Um, but it, it, it is sort of a tried and true. Again, this is taking all heat and cooling down and as well as ventilation air down to the classrooms through ductwork. Um, so there's a little DAV um, or fan cold units that are uh, located there that sort of modulate the air uh, outside the classrooms. Um, and then lastly, so the, the, the green cooling approach, um, similar to the air in the unit, but it's, it's just referred to in terms of different tech, uh, terminology. It's a DOAS or direct outdoor uh, air supply unit. Um, again, has energy recovery and all these systems will make use of that so that we're not trying to be as efficient as possible. Um, we're, fan power boxes are locally outside of classrooms um, and then we're feeding again air in with heating and cooling and then we have fans and optical windows to help modulate that. So that, that's sort of the overview. Has any thought been given the geothermal and then you could do radiant heated Floor, especially in a shop, especially in a classroom, and then with the heat pump system, you could air condition the classrooms. You do a geo with some wells, and you're pulling 50 degree water out of the ground. So it's very inexpensive to cool. And the thing of it is, I know we're in a climate change, but I went to high school. We never had air conditioning. We survived. <laughs> we made it. You know, I don't know what it is today. You got to have air conditioning, but the climate is changing. Yeah. But geothermal, this would be ideal for that. Drill some wells run radiant tubing in the shop. The guys would love it in the shop to work on their equipment to keep that floor at 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then you can heat the classrooms and then you just put a little heat pump in there and on the cooling side, you just run ductwork right down through the classrooms and you're done. Yep. Very little maintenance. I think it's a worth lot of comfort. That, that most new shops, especially that operate in winter, have heated floors for just desiccating. So to dry the floor. Mm -hmm. um, which pellet boilers and chip boilers did you look at? So we haven't delved completely down or into, all, into the biomass yet. Yeah. At, at all. At all. I think, yeah. yeah. So that's the part that's frustrating me. So do you know what percent of our electricity is in, in New England last year? Not off the top of my head. I think staff that. Um, 20%. 12. So you're suggesting that we heat this building and cool this building with 88% non-renewable energy. 
not accounting for the PV that's going to be on the roof of the building. If we can get that to happen. Sure. Right. Yep. Yep. So what I was proposing was 100% renewable, locally sourced, that is part of curriculum, that young people can learn that and then be employed across the fence by that. And so that's frustrating that you completely ignore that, that you cannot heat a greenhouse with an air source heat pump. So we're going to have to have a whole nother heating system for the greenhouse. So that is frustrating that you overlooked the radiant floor. So hydronic heating, like we talked about at the very first meeting, hydronic delivery. I don't think they're the enemy, John. No, I, I, so, that's how it feels. So, so I'm annoyed yeah, that yeah. This, is, this is the solution because it feels like the one size fits all. I called the, the city and APS compliant technologies are allowable within Massachusetts and within Camden. And I'm disappointed I think is the word, that you didn't even list it as an option to present to the group. You didn't even look into it. So I'm going to go back to the initial sort of framing of this discussion. We're uh -huh. coming with just an initial set of options to you. Um, the free feedback that we're hearing is that you would like us to put on the table for consideration some type of biomass system, yep. radiant heating uh, on the floor and geothermal potentially as well. Yep. Um, so we can add those to the mix and look at them. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, to, in terms of the rationale of why we didn't go down at least the geothermal route, is that we look at, so geothermal is also referred to as ground source heat pump, right, and air source heat pump. So those are just sort of, basically electricity is just moving heat and back, is, is moving heat backwards and forwards between different medium, either the air or the ground. Um, ground source heat pumps will be more expensive on a first cost basis uh, than the air source heat pump. Um, and then in terms of long-term maintenance, you're putting your, your energy transmission vehicle down in the ground where it's difficult to get at versus up on the roof. We don't have anything against ground source heat pumps. It's just that it's it's going to be more costly for maintenance in the long run and to install first cost. But we, we can look at what that cost is and again we can make a collective decision as to whether or not there's, there's value in terms of putting that in. Um, it's difficult to pencil out geothermal if you don't have a similar heat but cooling load is you literally are stealing BTUs out of the ground where they are not being replaced. They really, you, you have to cool as much as you heat. If you have a delta in that, you have to have a combustion delivery. UMass is probably yeah, right, right now. We're heating all the buildings, we're only cooling half the building. Correct, that's the difference. Yeah. Yep. And we don't have a particularly high cooling load in Massachusetts, especially for a school that is underutilized in the Very summer. limited time. You might be running in a little bit of May and part of June. Other than that, you're not using it. Unless right. you use that for some of the programs. So that, that's right. the dilemma of geothermal. Right. It's probably a handful of days that we're using in your late place late. for heating, especially in the shop areas yeah. and classrooms. Great. Right. So we'll we'll bring a mechanical engineer in again, then we'll sort of talk again and we'll make sure that we can talk more um, more detail about that. Um, as well as the biomass job we'll probably we'll tap you because I know that you're a wealth of information on that and we'll try to make sure that we're representing everything in a sort of fair and even manner. Um, on the greenhouse side of things, we, we did have a conversation with the greenhouse manufacturer that actually installed the recent controls that were put in. Um, they're very supportive and confident that an electric unit here, the Modine uh, manufacturer in particular, can provide, over the course of the past 50 years, they just provide electric heaters um, that can sufficiently heat the greenhouse. So it, it's an electric resistance heater. It is, a, right, exactly. It's the most expensive heat you can get. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Just super clear. Right, and so that, that's going to be on the evaluation criteria in terms of operations mm -hmm. cost and, and first cost. So it's four, four times the cost of gas. I like the idea of the radiant floor. How do you guys, if that is a possibility or well, option? We put, we put radiant heat into in the low last green. Right, we've never yep. used it. Because <laughs> we, we need a different way. We need, we need a different right. system to we heat need it. Oil we need the boil. But, but yeah, we would. Yeah. That'd be well, fine. With the geothermal, when we, if we did the radiant heat, it gets you to a certain temperature. Are we using electricity to use electricity on the get pump it to itself the next, to turn the next level. pump and it reverses itself from yep. between yep. heating and cooling? But you're pulling 50 degree water out of the ground. And what do we need it to be at when it's going? When you're cooling, 45, 50 degrees. No radiant cool. to get it up. We're using electricity. You probably up. run maybe 80, 85 degree water. Yeah. Maybe okay. in a real 10 below zero, you might be 110, maybe 120. But your average would only be 80, 85 degrees, 90 degrees. So you're talking heating from 50 to 90. Mm -hmm. 
it's so like once, that, like once it's warm, it stays warm. On the floor, yeah. Because that's your radiator. The whole concrete mm -hmm. floor is there. And when you open the door yeah. and it cools off two minutes later, it's back. It's right. awesome. It's awesome. I mean, to bring a piece of equipment in or for the guy to lay on the cement. Well, the air might cool off, but the floor is continuing yeah, to yeah, yeah. And dry it's warm. Dries itself. You open the doors and it'll cool off, yeah. and then about 10 minutes later, yeah. after you yeah. close the doors, you won't even know. Yeah. So yeah. a heat pump is, is just uh, robbing uh, uh, metabolic activity. Mm -hmm. And so the advantage of geothermal is the ground is always about the same temperature, right. it's about 50 odd degrees. The right. air source heat pump is. I understand the process. Yeah. Okay, but I just wanted to talk about it to get. I know because I do understand some of it that you have to get it from one level to another. Yeah, and since we can't get gas there, and if you have PV panels, it'll help. It'll help cover that. Yeah, yeah. that sounds that sounds good. You, um, you're not going to have enough roof space to cover the electric load to heat your building with your source heat pumps. So yeah. That's just the. You're going to need a couple more roofs. Now with the wells. Talk to me about where those go. Do they go and then they are paved over as the parking lot, or are they always another double all the ground? You just, you right, just we go down, them so you always yeah. know where they are. Yeah, if there's two the access point to, in case you had a. What? Okay, that's what I was asking. There, there's two stops. Right. One could be a slinky that's buried four feet down. So mm -hmm. Just a, a hoop of two. It's just a, to have that sort of uh, thermal exchange area. We're talking vertical now. So, so it could be either I preferred vertical yeah. than the slinkies. I've done both, yeah. and I see the vertical, and the wells are a lot more efficient. Okay. All right. Special space efficient. Because yeah, I, I think put a slinky in my house there. when I built it, and I did a big area in my field and went down seven feet. And by the end of the summer, I was heating up that ground to 70, 75 degrees. What would be the operator of the wells? And I'm 50 all summer, never yeah. changes. We've seen our electric bill go from, in the past five years, go from 75000 to 130000 Oh, yeah. It's just, just going to keep going up. I know. But I, <laughs> but no I matter what either way, but I guess use, no we're talking about sustainability is a word that means a lot of different things. Absolutely. But no matter what so, system you use in here, you're going to use a lot of electricity. A lot more electricity. Yes. I'm saying you're going to use less with Which the is geo. more cost effective. You use less, in my opinion, with the geo. Yeah, geothermal is going to be more efficient um, in terms of heating. Um, mm -hmm. and, Again, looking at operational costs versus yeah. first cost, so we just and have to balance of these guys. And that's because you're always dealing with 50 degrees instead of 50 the or zero, zero, zero or zero. negative yeah. 10 or whatever. So, yeah, so yeah. the air source heat pumps uh, uh, efficiency drops off considerably at like 20 degrees down to zero. And at 15 below, it's actually the same as a resistance heater. Not only that, if you get the tube for the floor donated, your students can put it in because that's what they teach them. Well, yeah, plumbing did that to the lower one. Yeah. And I know we can work through manufacturers to get the tube in and that stuff to donate it. And the students can put it in. So yeah, the biggest expense yeah. really is a piece of equipment and the wells. Yeah. In terms of being able to predict the system performance as well, what we often do is do a test well um, to understand what conductivity exists in the localized soil condition that's there. So that would be something we might want to Well, usually we work with two or three well drillers. And once you tell them the area, yep. they already know. They have a pretty good idea of what what they need to do, whether they need to go 400, 600, 800, or 1,000 feet. Yeah. You know, but they know. And once I do the heat loss on the building, they'll know how many Small wells. college is putting a lot of them in, and so they'll, they'll yeah. have a good idea as well. And yeah. they can tell you, the geothermal people can tell you how many wells you're going to need to condition 10,000 square feet. We're working on a number of those buildings at Smith College now with their low carbon. Okay. That's great. I think we get some but contact information. If, if your electric bill is using dedicated gas, right, to get it up, not electricity, <coughs> to get it up. All electric. I thought they were using dedicated gas from every source, no? The only gas they have is That's in their main plant. They're trying to get away from the gas and yeah. the other buildings. Okay. So air source heat pumps, again, geothermal as well. They're often designed to do most of the heat because otherwise you have to oversize the system to catch all the BTUs you need on that really cold. And so they're often there's there's often a peak or heating system to to support even air source heat pumps have toaster ovens in them mm -hmm. for that difficult hard to heat night. So that's the dilemma. I think that might be what you're you're hearing. Um, that said, electricity is as while it is sort of a miracle fuel, is absolutely increasing faster yeah. than all the other fuels price point wise. And so does the campus want to Hitch its wagon to that P 
fuel, because that's what we would be doing. It would be an electrically heated building. Yes, air source heat pumps are better than just straight resistance heating, provided it's not that cold. But there, you, yeah. you're, you're going to be stuck with it. Yeah. Are there grants or other monies for either of those options? I, I want to just weigh in, if I may. It's yeah. kind of relevant. So just some context is, so I'm the chief procurement officer. One of the things um, when I was hired um, was partially, what, part of the reasons I was hired is my sustainability background. I have an MBA and um, sustainable enterprise. Um, my first public sector job, by the way. But Mayor Sheriff created the Climate Action and Project Admin Department and moved my position from the auditor's office to this position, trying to integrate sustainability and climate, climate neutrality into all the city's dealings. So I just want to say, like, I'm really happy to hear kind of you guys thinking thoughtfully about this. And as far as where the city of Northampton stands, like, we want to see more energy efficient buildings that are, you know, meeting the climate neutrality goals of the city. As you may know, Mayor, uh, the governor of Massachusetts wants to be carbon neutral as a state by 2050. Mayor Sher is trying to exceed that goal by being carbon neutral, neutral as a city by 2030. So all this building and any other project we work on in the city, um, we're kind of looking at it from that lens. Um, to your last question, we have a new energy officer that's really diving into um, understanding how we could electrify our vehicles fleet, how we can make our buildings more energy efficient, including all Smith Lopes. So I think that, if I may, I think the city wants to see these, this building be as carbon neutral as possible, even if it is more investment up front. Um, I would say, I know there are programs out there. Um, I kind of, my specialty or expertise is regard procurement law, which is um, chapter 30B, chapter 149, but there's a whole other chapter, um, 25A, it's the Green Communities Act, and that those procurement thresholds are much higher that is a long-winded way of saying, I believe there may be opportunity to um, secure funds, be they from the state or otherwise, to try to um, get some funding for this building so it's more carbon neutral, if at all yeah. possible. And, and I think, um, you know, what back to the siding, whether it's metal or another material, I think what you were saying is really important, is what is the long-term use? What are the needs of Smith Vocational long-term? Um, both to be carbon neutrality, like, Carbon, more carbon neutral now, but also later down the line. Like, what are the needs of the students? And so um, I just want to put that, like, the whole CAPA climate neutrality thing is a huge priority of the city, and, like, that's what we want to see. So, I mean, I think it's really important to dive into geothermal, understanding what the PV options are, et cetera. So I don't really have the expertise technically that you all do, but I just want to put that out generally, that that's something I would love to see personally, but also the city is, like, totally invested in making that happen, so for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's also important that we remember the three R's and the first one is reduce. So mm -hmm. it's important. I would like to know that we are exceeding expectations for insulation because the less energy we need, because the less we've shed, then the less you're going to have to spend to put back into the building. And that is an upfront cost, but it is a, a benefit for the life of that building. And so it has a considerable long-term benefit. Um, but how the heat is delivered, whether it be uh, hydronic, like we talked about previously, uh, and how the greenhouse is going to get heated. I, I, I appreciate that electric heating is the what you suggested, but electric resistance heating is a, a irresponsible way of heating the least insulated part of that building. I would wager that the greenhouse uh, BTU consumption will exceed the rest of the whole building. And if you choose to heat with a, a strategy like resistance heating, that is an irresponsible way, in my opinion, to condition that building. Back to the grant funds, that's a big, <clears throat> we're probably sitting, even if the building was built without, we just said, put the cheapest stuff in, the, the, the hour that startup cost, I mean, we're still sitting at probably having only 70% of what we need. So I know these are great conversations theoretically, and you know, but when we look at managing it, we're going to have to find other sources of funds, especially if we're looking to take it to another level. So, I mean, whatever help we can. Yeah, his name's have Josh Singer, and I can chat with him. We're tomorrow. really going to need it, I think. I think Green Communities is a terrific yeah. starting point. I think that MVP is another one. The trouble with MVP, though, is that because it's a regional school and, and there is, uh, uh, well, it, it's a Northampton school, but it has participation from regional sending schools that mm -hmm. may 
require buy-in from all of those towns too, which is going to be incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. We tried something similar in Chesterfield with the New Bingham Elementary, but mm -hmm. because it's shared by Goshen, you have to have both energy committees support the idea and it becomes kind of an unbuilding. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I think it's worth pursuing and there may be a sort of a, a way to sort of supersede that. Mm -hmm. um, Forest Service is also prepared to provide considerable funds for a wood heating system. I think that's important to recognize. Who's, uh, um, who's are, you with, are you talking with the U.S. Forest Service? Yep. Blue McCreary. Yep. Okay. Let's see what uh, they've got available for funding. To let Joe know that was uh, mm -hmm. an important thing there, and, you know, to fill in some of that 30 percent that you're still missing. Yep. It, the operating cost is something that is uh, hard to define at this point. It, we're struggling to find the money to build it. And then right. if we build it, we're like, well, dang, we can hardly keep the lights on. I, I always say, I always tell people, anybody can afford to buy anything. Yeah. We can find the money to buy it, but they can keep it. That's the yeah. sustainability. Yeah. That, that's that's why sustainability. different yeah. definitions yeah. of sustainability. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. have to be definitely considered. John, at one point a few years ago, you talked about tapping into Cooley Day. Absolutely. They're yep. still open to that idea. Absolutely. You're shaking your head, yes. Yeah, so. I just heard about that. It sounded really like a cool, interesting yeah. project. It's what, condensate. What do you mean by yeah. tapping into? So Cooley Dickinson has a large format heating system that's generally steam. And so they have returned condensate. And there was an investigation to, to look at whether the, the city would be interested in, in receiving condensate so to hydronically eat all of the campus. And it was really a no big deal to the, to the hospital to, to give perspective to the scale of the hospital's eating. It would not make a, a notable difference to their fuel consumption. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it would improve their efficiency because the return uh, condensate would be cooler and so have a greater uh, delta T and so more absorbent of the energy that they could provide. I heard this before, I have questions for it. Because maybe you can answer or not. Who owns the lines? Who services the lines? What happens if they decide that they're changing their heating system? What's their commitment level? How do you yes. know what I mean? What, 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 I heard that before questions. and like immediately I was like mm -hmm. I'm concerned though. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it becomes a, what, a district heating system. Yep. And I would not uh, uh, remove your current heating system. Why yeah. would you? Just leave it in there. It just mothball the thing. And so my feeling is that what's the cost of uh, plumbing that heat? It's, it's, you know, a couple hundred grand probably. So it's not a nothing burger, mm -hmm. but your heat, you know what it costs, or the city does, what it costs to heat this campus per year. So for them, it's a nothing. They are going to need to replace their boiler next year or the year after. We're doing them this year. For, for Cooley Dickinson, you're doing We've the- We've got them on order right now. Right, but those are the natural gas and oil ones, not not the the base load wood one. Yep, not the wood one. Yep. So that one is going to get replaced, and it's going to be EPS compliant. So it's going to zero the fuel bill. So as long as they know that this is going to be part of the load, it doesn't matter because their fuel is free. Because they're always going to need steam. Yep. And so so the question of will they turn off steam and use different? They can't because the whole campus is plumbed for steam. And steam has the, sort of the awkward bit of so you got to make it seem to get home for steam too. In AJ. Fair enough, but it's just yes, good good analogy. But that is definitely not in the to do list because okay. of the number of um, it, and it sounds ridiculous, but they pump for steam because they had all these auto plates scattered all over, and how we'll run steam throughout the whole place, mm -hmm. and we can like clean the tools wherever we want to yeah. instead of just putting electric ones in here and there where needed. It's it's a bad idea for them because. It's not a great way to heat the place. If they had hydronic in the first place, it would be way better. But regardless, it would take some disruption here. You have to run a pipe across the football field and then disseminate it. But engineering is really not that hard to, to plumb it in. It's pretty heat. You know, and with this boring that they do right now, it wouldn't have to be dug to get out of it just pour it. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I can't speak to that. It's beyond my expertise. But it, the hospital is all about it because. Mm -hmm they have sort of an awkward tax status in town and they're pretty aware that they're not paying taxes. And so to donate the heat, they can use that as a write-off and they can use it as a, a, a goodwill and they can claim the carbon that you're not emitting 
in their ledger. It's way cheaper for them to help you decarbonize than to decarbonize their scattered facilities in Concord or wherever. It's very, very attractive. Win-win. So who's going to investigate that? It's already been done. Post engineering already did that assessment. Cafe. But at the time, it was not something that the, the school was particularly receptive to. I'd like to chat with you more about that. Sure. Let's do it. Circle back just on sort of the larger takeaways <laughs> from this discussion, which is an excellent discussion. And really, this is almost exactly what we wanted to have happen is just to have this initial dialogue on it because we know there's a lot of layers to this. Um, shop spaces, it sounds like ventilation and heating is the way to go there. Is there any desire for air conditioning within the shops amongst the group? Maybe by <laughs> them. Yeah. I'm staring right at my shops. <laughs> Well, the teachers yeah. and the students would always love to have it. <laughs> Could we survive without it? Yes. So the, the, the classrooms would be would be air conditioned, but not the shop. Is that what you're saying? The, the two the two the garage space based areas would not be. Okay. And the headhouse would be air conditioned as well. It sounds like. Right. Those farms out there got air conditioning in their barns and shops. Right. Or DBW. Yeah, yeah but you yeah. know what? Yeah. How many farmers are out there now? Not a, not a hell of a lot of them. <laughs> These guys aren't built like the farmers that we know. That we know from there. Yeah. So yeah, air conditioning right. aside, that, right? whether it's Cooley Dix heat or, or geothermal or pellet heat, that's hydronic. So that is a, perhaps the most salient investigation is what is what is slab heat look like? Mm -hmm. And then the AC can be sort of a, a moving target. But like ultimately, if you're going to slab hydronically heat, then you can worry about what the heat is made by. Like, yeah, because you could heat that from that condensate and cool it down. Then the amount of wells you'd have to drill, or the size of the well, just for air conditioning in those offices, minimum. Or it could be just a, a rooftop one that's or back up just for heat for the office. Or well, the classrooms would be nice to have it. Eh? Yeah, and for the simulators, <laughs> well, simulators are going to drive air conditioning. It's sort of the cruel reality that you give. Computers, air conditioning. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. You brought all these lines together. Yeah. All, all the things that you can think about. In the yeah, because yeah, you can bring that condensate in through a heat exchanger and still do your radiance. <laughs> your radiance is going to be low temp. I think you've got to have air conditioning in the classroom. The classrooms and head house and office, yes. The, yeah. the shops were the. Oh, wait, we the, haven't said office. <laughs> the first time I heard office. <laughs> well, hey, you know, you know what, Joe? My office will be in the head house or one of those classrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Um, All I gotta do is open all the windows to the air conditioned areas. It's a fan. So I, I think what might be helpful as a path forward is that we certainly have the next building committee meeting. Maybe before that, we actually have a smaller working group that is just tied to mechanical systems. We get into a lot of the detail because, it, well, this is great. I'm guessing it's also not exactly sort of time efficient for everyone to be going to this level of building. So if we could maybe collect a um, smaller subset, we'll schedule maybe a week or two out. Uh, for like a working group, um, and then we can come back and bring fine this from the working group back to the SGC. Yeah, I mean, and I can touch base with Jonathan Slater. He's the director of facilities in the hospital and see if that's something that they're still. That would be great. Would contemplate that. Mm -hmm. and speak that. Yeah, yep, I might too. So, you want to that one? Group volunteers. Can we <laughs> name them now? I'm looking at one right now. <laughs> looking at two. To talk about energy systems, is that you kind of the work here? Yeah. The I'd like to be there, yeah, maybe. I uh, definitely think you should be. I'd like yeah. to loop in my uh, colleague, Josh Singer. He's yeah. the energy officer yeah. for the city. Yeah. Okay. That would be great. Yeah, it's like a, that's comparable. Jim, if you can give us the names of local drillers, I know that's something our Henshaw, three free shelter bar cushion. He's the one I do ninety percent of the uh, deal with. Done some with with uh, Henshaw, so the bar is on top. Bar cushion. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. It's, it's cushion and it's cushion. It's, it's either side. Great. 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 Great.
Okay. <laughs> drop your name? That's yeah, awesome. Drop the name. Okay. <laughs> we've done Eagle work with them. We've done a lot of projects with them. Great. Um, so just really quickly, um, I'll, I'll nutshell this for you. So we are very much still in the site investigation world. Um, we've mentioned we, we don't have furniture design group here tonight. They're a little bit on hold until we get some more survey information. So we've got some site investigations that need to happen. We have some things lined up. Um, we're hoping all of that can be completed this month. That does push our SD package going out to the estimators three to four weeks later than we had hoped. So we are looking at the middle of September for our cost estimator. Um, obviously, we hit that moment of the schematic design cost estimating. We can pull in these options for systems and, you know, things that we want to consider um, you know, so we have good cost data to make decisions moving forward. So um, that's, we're still looking at being able to make, you know, the building ready for, for occupants, uh, for students in the fall of 2025. We still think that schedule can work, um, but we do need a, a elongated schematic design phase to uh, accommodate the site in this paid work. So any questions on the schedule? That's Pretty much where we are right now. It's a lot of work to pull it all together. Thank you. No scintillating conversation on the schedule. I'll find that <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've exhausted you. So, um, and we'll again, we'll continue to meet with our small working group um, on a weekly basis. We meet um, Tuesday mornings. We've just established a new working group for mechanical systems. I think I have the date of the next building committee here as September 12th. The 19th. It's the 19th? The 19th. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah. There's no school, but we can see. Yeah. Correct. That's actually probably better. Mm -hmm. There no school. Primary data. That's right. There's no primary. There's no primary, no, thank you. They're not having one because they they don't need one. Trumpy Town. Are there other community centers? Yeah, there's still a lot of work. 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 Yeah, there's still a